good friend, and he's got a great title, Free Grace, the first fundamental of discipleship. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks, buddy. Well, good afternoon. How are you doing? I don't have a clue what I'm doing up here. I really don't. I sit and I come to these, and uh, a couple of years ago, I was at, uh, where's Stephen Lewis? Uh, there he is, and I was at his workshop, and I'm back there taking notes, and I'm smiling like I know what I'm doing. I was just writing down words I didn't, I had to go home and look up. And uh, so anyway, it's like, what, they, these guys have forgotten more theology than I know, but um, what am I doing up here? But it's a privilege, and I want to thank you, and I'm excited, and I am just so happy to be here. I am a free grace man from beginning to end. Now, none of you know me, so I brought some pictures. You want to see some pictures? Do you? Yeah, okay. These are all my grandchildren, all 86 of them. No, no. I grew up in the Air Force. My dad flew that in World War II, the B-24, and he flew that B-52 in Vietnam, Korea in between. I went here to university, and if you don't know what that is, wait a minute, if you don't know what that is, you're probably not a Christian. <laughs> and if you are a Christian, there's your definition of carnality, if you don't know. And there I met this Texas cheerleader, from Tyler, Texas, and we've been married 45 years this summer. How about that, huh? I know. And for those of you who are calculating, that's 315 dog years. So she's my best friend, my greatest cheerleader. Um, she loves sports more than I do, which is saying a lot. She gets mad at me if I watch any recorded game without telling her I'm watching it. So basically, I married a a guy with all the bells and whistles, so that's what. <laughs> I'll let that sink in for a minute there. <laughs> She's, uh, she speaks the truth in love. She's forgiven me for more than I can count. We came out of Africa. I was teaching in Africa a few years ago. We travel the world to teach. And I also love art, so we go, we're in Madrid. There's three great art museums there, the Prado, the Thyssen, and the Sofia. So we were in, in Madrid for a while, and we're sitting at the plaza having a cup of coffee before we go see Picasso's Guernica. And, and all of a sudden she goes, man, young guys sure are getting bald or younger these days. And I just kind of stop because nothing critical ever comes out of her mouth. She just refuses to do it, and I just thought, Wow, what a surprise. And I said, well, I, I can't say too much. I mean, I've got this growing UFO crop circle coming in the back of my head. And she looks at me and she goes, ah, yeah, but you're, you're sexy. And I kind of sat there. My eyebrow went up like, like Sean Connery's does, you know. And, and I said, well, thanks. And she goes, thanks for what? I said, well, not many wives call their husbands Sexy. And she said, I didn't say you were sexy. I said, you're 60. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And then it got worse. It got worse. She goes, did you really think I called you sexy? <laughs> and I, and, and, you know, I said, no, well, I was just, I, no. <laughs> So anyway, I love her so much. Hope I hit the right buttons. No, wait, whoa, whoa. Right arrow, I did, I hit the right arrow. Boom, oh, is it there, oh, okay. There's our four children and our eight grandchildren. Do you want me to talk about each one of them? No, I know you don't. <laughs> I love the ministry. This was our first class back in 2002 in New Zealand. It was an advanced Christian leadership program. We did that for many, many years, and now we live. I told my wife, I'm missing home. She goes, what are you really missing? And I said, I'm missing college football. Let's go back to America. So, <laughs> and I was. Uh, I love the mountains. I climb mountains around the world. This is one of the many trips to the Himalayas. I love the great art of the world. We went to St. Petersburg just to see Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son. I love golf. <laughs> I love to worship. <laughs> it's 
That's one of my grandchildren. <laughs> and most of all, I love her. And I love to travel with her. Okay. Now, this year's uh, conference is on evangelism and discipleship. My session today is Free uh, Grace, the First Fundamental of Discipleship, or you could say Steve's First Fundamental, if you don't agree. And the title of my workshop on Wednesday is Pleasing God, the Focus of Discipleship. Now, in my 40 no, 30 minutes, oh my goodness, I want to do three things. I want to confess something up front. I want to tell you a brief story, and then I want to encourage you with the importance of grace. In other words, I want to encourage you to press on in the direction I know you're already going or you wouldn't be at this conference. Through it all, I am an unapologetic cheerleader for GEF. I love and thank God for this ministry. And so I, I'm not paid to say these things. I just love and thank God for this ministry. And I don't know if there's a more appreciative fan. Now, I want to confess something. I confess that I believe, and see, I'm going to miss, see, I'd never, that there is little or no chance of growing or helping someone else grow in Christ as a disciple, a follower of Christ, without an understanding and acceptance of an application of the grace of God. There is Pharisaic growth. There is legalistic growth. There is, lo there is knowing lots of stuff growth. But that is not what we want for ourselves or for others. I could tell you story after sad story, and you could tell me the same, of Christians I know and have known, friends, relatives, who faithfully attend good churches, who faithfully study their good Bibles, but who, because there is little or no internalization of the grace of God, because there is little or no devoted application of the grace of God, are not growing spiritually, genuinely in Jesus Christ. Now, Ryrie, who I was fortunate enough to be personally discipled by for three years in my master's program when Bob and I were in school, wrote this, Grace is an inseparable part of Christian living. Not only has the grace of God been gloriously manifested in the gift of Christ, but grace vitally affects the life of the believer. Grace teaches the believer how to live and encompasses the whole concept of growth, discipline, maturing, obedience, progress, and the like, page 51 of his book. And by the way, my opinion, one reason why Christians today, any day, fall so easily into legalism is because they have not grown and are not growing in the grace of God. Without knowing a real dollar bill, you're not going to know what a counterfeit looks like. Without knowing the properties of 20 karat gold, you're going to be fooled by fool's gold. Without knowing grace, there is sometimes little chance that I will recognize legalism is Paul writes about legalism in the general sense. Indeed, it has the appearance of wisdom. This sounds good. This seems wise. This seems like a good direction. And if we do not stay on top of grace in our lives and in our ministries, not only do we have to worry about the Galatians problem, what happens when grace walks out the door, Legalism will show up at our door and walk in and take over. Now, what is legalism? If you do research on this, you will get all kinds of descriptions. You'll rarely get a refined, down to the, the foundation uh, explanation or definition. I finally came across this about 30 years ago when I was writing my doctoral dissertation. And it was from F.F. F. Bruce, and it was in his commentary to the Galatians on page 137, and he said this, it is the idea that performance wins acceptance before God. I've always used that, and I've always liked it, because to me, it's virtually the opposite of grace. The idea that performance, behavior, somehow wins the acceptance 
the affection, the love of God. So acceptance, not based on grace, but on performance, on presentation, on how you look. Always reminds me of this poem I ran across one time that kind of summarizes legalism. Jim's girl is rich and haughty. My girl is poor as clay. Jim's girl is young and pretty. My girl looks like a bale of hay. Jim's girl is smart and clever. My girl is dumb but good. But would I trade my girl for Jim's? You bet your life I would. That's legalism. That's the spirit of it. Now let's say you believe that salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, on the cross alone. I always say it like that. I love saying it like that. And then I always say, not an ounce of my sweat, not an ounce of my blood, not an ounce of my tears are up on that cross. Nothing of me up on that cross. And let's say someone you love embraces this free grace gift of salvation, what then are we done with grace? Well, some are. Some are done with grace. Now, let me transition to a story. Not long ago, I was teaching in Africa, and it was a master's course in which senior church leaders were enrolled. And the course was on, I'm changing some of the details here so I don't get in trouble. The course was on discipleship. And it was about growing one's spiritual foundation. It was about principles of maturing in Christ. It was about commitment, suffering, and sacrificing for Jesus Christ. That's the course. It was a one-year course. The course focused on what many of us call the disciplines of the Christian life. As Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 4, 7, you all know, exercising ourselves toward godliness. I think that's taken from the GES Standard Bible, otherwise known as the New King James Version Bible. <laughs> other, in other words, like an athlete, how do we exercise our spiritual lives? Which spiritual muscles do we work on? What promotes excellent spiritual health? Why sacrifice and for what reasons? Now, in this course I, that I was teaching, there was a required book and a required textbook. And I need to add that neither was written by me or required by me. They were assigned. And in these two sources, the book and the workbook, there were, they were packed with a list of disciplines, okay? The disciplines of a disciple, Spiritual exercises like worship and evangelism and fasting and quiet solitude and sacrificial giving and servant leadership and the dis discipline of genuine forgiveness, which was fantastic. But of the dozens of spiritual disciplines outlined in the book and the workbook, there was virtually, and I'm not exaggerating, nothing on the grace of God. Nothing. Nothing. Of the dozens of how-tos in regard to spiritual formation, there was not one mention of the grace of God. One section with several chapters pushed hard on the, the disciples' love for God and self-sacrifice. Now, discipleship is all about discipleship is all about sacrifice and self-denial and loving God, right? But where in the material was the groundwork for all of this? You see, there's some of the groundwork. We love him because he first loved us. That's the fertile soil of healthy growth. That's the grace of God. And that was nowhere mentioned ever in this course. Now, the Apostle Peter wrote in his last written words, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the word for grow, the Greek akthano, used to describe the maturing, the growth of a child or a plant. And what is in the primary position there? What's the primary fertilizer of this? Is what? The grace of God. And in this entire course, lasting one full year, there was zero emphasis on it. And I told my class, this was a tremendous group of intelligent, committed, long-serving leaders in this country some of them with doctorates of their own. And I told my class, I said, if you blindly follow these course materials, 
If I do not help you get a grip on the grace of God, there is a strong chance you will end up, if you're not already there, in bondage, without peace, hoping, as I put it, for the love of God, as if it's out there somewhere you've got to go chase, rather than serving and living from the grace of God as a foundation upon which you truly stand as a believer in Christ. And so I taught them grace, and I taught them free grace, and I graded and interacted their assignments for one year. And I got unbelievable emails and replies like this one. Look at this. Dearest Dr. Steve, as you know, I lead a large evangelism ministry with 400 employees. And before you came to teach us, I never knew these grace truths. These life-changing, life-altering grace truths. What a joy to watch my life untangle from the barbed wire. Is that a cool way to describe it? Of legalism. My life and my ministry are forever, forever, forever changed. To quote the GES New Testament commentary, which I am, if you don't have it, you need to get it. Teachings that, on Hebrews 13, 9, teachings that emphasize the grace of God are what strengthen the heart. We come to know God through the gospel of grace, and we are to draw on his grace for our spiritual pilgrimage. Now, is that right? Amen. Isn't that just incredibly beautiful and simple and powerful? Now, that's my story. Now, for a bit of encouragement. How many of you, desire to grow in Christ. Okay, about five of us. How many, <laughs> no, I'm teasing. How many of you desire to see your children, your grandchildren grow in Christ? How many of you desire to see, help your fellow believers, your church, discipline themselves for the purpose of godliness? That's all of us. Now, let me just give you a couple of examples because I'm having to watch the time. Just take, what about the discipline of prayer? Just take that one. You're going to preach a series on prayer. Fantastic. Great. Now, let me ask you a question. How am I going to pray? And how am I going to teach someone to pray without an understanding of the grace of God? First Peter 5, verse 10, the apostle tells us to whom we are praying. We're praying to the God of all grace our gracious Father in heaven. And in Hebrews 4, 16, when we pray, we are told to draw near to our God of all grace boldly or with confidence. Now the word means, as I understand it, to speak freely and without fear as I approach him. In other words, I approach my gracious Father in heaven humbly but I am also to stand tall with cheerful courage or boldness. Now, why can I be cheerfully bold in prayer? Well, look, look at Hebrews 4.16. It tells me. Because I'm drawing near to what? A throne of grace. A gracious throne. And what do I find at this gracious throne? Where my God of all grace sits. I obtain mercy and I find grace to help me in my time of need. So good luck preaching a series on prayer and how to pray without understanding the grace of God. To whom are we praying? The God of all grace. Where do we go when we pray? To the throne of grace. What do we find at that throne? Grace to help in our time of need. Now, let's take another one. How about evangelism? This was, this was really, really big. The spiritual discipline of evangelism. What do you want your people to do? Maybe you want them to buy this t-shirt and walk around. I don't think so. I don't own one. I'll never buy one. First, the message is dependent upon grace, is it not? Ephesians 2.8, we know these. By grace we're saved through faith, not as a result of works. It's a gift. 
Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, offering this gift of eternal life. Okay? Right? Second, I, the messenger, am to be gracious and humble. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. In other words, what's wisdom look like? Let your speech always be with what? Grace. Seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And guess what? Not only that, but third, I, the messenger, am not alone. Hebrews 10, 29 calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of grace. Rod Mocker uh, changes that a bit, and I love it. He says the dispenser of grace. That's fantastic. And then Jesus tells me in John 16 and 7 following, when I graciously go next door, The spirit of grace has gone before me, convicting, convincing my unsaved friends of concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. It is a grace message to be shared graciously in teamwork with the spirit of grace. In New Zealand and countries I've taught recently like Kenya and Nepal and Romania and Nigeria, you are eternally saved, maybe, Maybe by faith plus faithfulness. Now, gospel invitations, as we like to say, are either front-loaded, back-loaded, or I see a lot of them that are just fully loaded and spilling out over the top. (laughs) Well, that's a mess. That's a mess. And if that's a mess, discipleship will follow on as a mess, right? It's like a cancer cell attaching itself to another cancer cell. That's how it works. I like Spurgeon. We are not responsible to God for the number of souls that are saved, but we are responsible for the gospel that is preached and for the way in which we preach it. That's a great comment, eh? We all agree with that, right? Okay, how's my time? Am I okay? One more and then I'll I'll wrap it up. And what about my struggle with sin as a disciple? Oh, i got to skip that one. What about my struggle with sin? That's me. I'm bad. My wife tells me, and she tells me, Steve, if people really knew you, no one would ever come to hear you talk. She tells me that all the time. I'm not sure she's teasing. Anyway, there is a war going on inside me, a never-ending, relentless war. Galatians 5.17, am I there? For Steve's, it says Steve in the Greek, Steve's flesh, (laughs) lust, sets its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Now, I like the way Bob Wilkin uh, puts it. And by the way, if you ever want a speaker, it's smart to quote the president of GES (laughs) positively. Of Galatians 5.17, Bob writes, there's a tension within each believer The Holy Spirit moves him to loving service, and the flesh moves him to biting conflict. In Romans 7, 19, the Apostle Paul said, almost the same thing, not as well as Bob, but he said, for the good good that I wish to do, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. Now, I have practiced this evil all of my life, okay? When I was a little boy, my dad, who's a great dad, I have a brother two years younger than me. He's a best-selling author. I hate him for that. But anyway, he's a best-selling <laughs> author. And he's two years younger than me. And my dad was trying to teach us about generosity one time. So he called us over, and he said, I'm going to give you both two quarters. And I want you to go off, and I want you to learn about sharing and generosity. I want you to, you can keep one. I want you to give one away. And we're going, yeah, my brother's going, oh, that's such a good thing. You know, my brother's watching Billy Graham. This is such a good thing. And I don't get more out of my dad's eyesight. And I pull my brother over and I got, I say, I got an idea. You give me yours and I'll give you mine. <laughs> I did this. What's he do? He goes crying to dad. That was a bad day. Now, what's the answer to these big daily battles, these skirmishes that I have with temptation and sin that every disciple has? Well, there's lots of answers, but I'll give you one. Just one. There it is. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared, 
it, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. By grace through faith, I am saved from my sin. By grace through faith, I am taught about my sin. By grace through faith and the fact that God is at work in me, I can say yes to righteousness and I can say no to ungodliness. But for me, it begins and ends with the grace of God. How much time do I have? I want to read this letter. I think it matters not which spiritual discipline you pick. Pick worship. What's Colossians 3.16 say? Let's sing with grace in our heart. I can just go down the list. It matters not which discipleship topic you choose. I do not know how I grow in it apart from an understanding and an internalization and application of the grace of God. But untold, thousands around the world are trying to do it every single day and they need our help. Now, what is the grace of God? I leave you with this. It's one of the best presentations of grace I've come across in the 10 most misunderstood words in the Bible. It's written by a guy named Robert N. Wilkin. He goes by Bob to all those committed to free grace. And uh, chapter 8 on grace. Read it. It's fantastic. It's not just this simplistic definition. You get the whole range and examples. I've used it. I've stolen from it. It's two chapters past the chapter on hell and two chapters before the chapter on judgment, so you need to pay attention. <laughs> by the way, it's always smart, again, to endorse and recommend a book by the president of GES. So. I thank God for the Grace Evangelical Society, for its emphasis, for the battles it fights, by the way, that it fights graciously, and for its impact it's had on my spiritual life and untold thousands of others. Because of the free grace of God, I have eternal life and I have assurance. Because of the free grace of God, I can grow my Christian life. Because of the free grace of God, I can teach and preach and help others to grow as committed, self-sacrificing followers of Christ. Now, I may go over one minute, but I'm going to do this. Let me tell you something. Something you don't know about me because you don't know me. There is nothing special about me. I've been an average guy all my life. But the man who first climbed Mount Everest, Everett, uh, Edmund Hillary, said something. He said, you don't have to be a, basically a fantastic person. Just try to do fantastic things. Or the way I translate it is, you don't have to be a fantastic person. I'm not. Deliver a fantastic message. And that message is the grace of God. I got this letter 25 years ago from someone at our church, at Fellowship Bible Church in Colorado Springs. Do you all remember, is it still going on? I've been in New Zealand for 20 years. Uh, it was called the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Do we still do that here on, in January? Well, I used to deliver that message every January at Fellowship Bible Church. Now, you can deliver an abortion message, an anti... You can deliver this in a lot of different ways, okay? But if you're committed to free grace and grace... And the heart of God, it might be tweaked a bit, don't you think? Well, I got this letter, and I cry every time I read it. And if you don't like that, then I'm sorry. Dear Steve, I have had it, and then I'm done. I have had it on my heart to write you for a long time, but have never made the time until now. God has used you to bring healing to my life, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in a large church in another part of the country, and although I could say nice things about it, it had a very legalistic doctrine. What I remember most from the teaching was the long list of things I could not do. As soon as I got away to college, I started doing all those things and more. I also became sexually active in a relationship I was in, and to make a long story short, I had abortions, plural when I was in college. I didn't go to church except on rare occasion because I was ashamed of myself and I didn't feel I would ever be forgiven in my denomination. And if I did have the baby, I was almost certain no one would ever accept me. I'm afraid it already sounds like I'm blaming the church for my actions. I'm not at all. I take full responsibility for my decisions. My point is the church didn't feel like a safe place of sanctuary. Funny, since that's what we call the room we worshiped in. 
After my last abortion, I started dating the man I'm now married to. He talked me into going to church with him one morning. We went in and sat down, and it was Sanctity of Life Sunday. All the pastor talked about was the evil and the horror of abortion. Well, I got up and I left in the middle of the sermon and didn't go back to church for a very long time because it confirmed every bad thing I thought about myself and everything I was certain the church thought about, quote, people like me. About a year later, I went to church again. I sat down in the pew and guess what? I opened the bulletin. It was Sanctity of Life Sunday. I didn't even bother to wait to hear the sermon. I just got up and left. My husband and I moved to your city. We were looking for a place to grow spiritually, and we heard about your church, and we visited the office building downtown where you taught. As God would have it, the first Sunday, Sanctity of Life Sunday, January 1991. God is obviously trying to tell me something. My husband asked if I wanted to leave. But for some reason, we stayed. You gave the most gracious message. I felt like I was the only person in the room and you were talking directly to me. Your voice was kind and your words were gentle. And you told me that you loved me no matter the abortion in my past no matter what was in my past. Instead of feeling alone like I had in church for so long, I felt loved and accepted. I sat and I cried on the back row the entire time. I'd been in church my whole life hearing about grace. Now listen to this, what she says. All my life, but I never understood what it meant before your teaching. I've tried to explain this to friends who grew up with me in church, and they say, oh yeah, grace, we know what that is, but they don't, and they're not excited about it. Anyway, my point is I have never felt as liberated and free as the day I walked out after your teaching, and I wanted to thank you. As I told my husband, I'll always regret my decisions to abort my babies, and I'll always be sad when I think of the lives they could have led. But I know I am loved by God, and I do not have to keep on punishing myself. Jesus has died for my many sins, and he has freed me to live the life he has planned for me. Your gracious message was, listen to this, was the catalyst for starting me on my road to healing and a new life. I feel like you are my friend, even though I've only met you one time. That's the power of the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Thank you. We don't have time for questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> Say it. Eight minutes. eight minutes of questions. <laughs> I'm sorry, I get so emotional when I read that letter. Okay, do I get to pick which ones? Yeah. <laughs> Spell your first name. S T E P. No. When teaching this great truth, how do you confront hyper grace rebukes? You know, last year. Uh, when I did the workshop here, I was asked a similar question. And I tell you what I often do is I ask people to start defining their terms. Mm -hmm. So I kind of put it back on them a little bit. Tell me what you mean. Why do you say that? So I just kind of twist it back and ask for the definition of terms. And then the hyper grace rebukes, I mean, I don't know. She keep showing grace. Keep being gracious. You know, I used to be a hyper grace rebuke. I used to be a pure legalist out of a certain denomination here in the state of Texas where my parents and grandparents grew up. I've been through every stage of this. And so I say start with being gracious and asking for the definition of terms and being kind and don't get upset, be calm, and don't expect to win them over in that singular discussion. And then hit them as hard as you possibly can. 
Okay, no. Okay, now there's no, that's it. I just got one. Any more? Oh, by the way, I put my email address up there if you want to send an um, uh, Amazon gift certificate. <laughs> Do what? Yeah, no, that's why I put it up there. I don't want you to write me otherwise. <laughs> okay, that's it. Everybody happy? So I can go? All right, wow. Is that the simplest ever, huh? All right, thank you all. God bless you. All right.